for free. Steve led us in a beautiful, beautiful, intimate journey this morning. And it's just, I think, part of um, where God is taking us this week. And it, it was really beautiful this morning. It was very intimate. It was very healing. And so I would, uh, I would suggest either tonight, uh, if you can do, get online tonight and watch it, but find a place where maybe you can just kick your feet back and listen to uh, it. It really was beautiful this morning. So uh, it's just been, Steve's done an awesome job. And Daniel and Eddie. So we thank God for them. So shall we just stand to our feet? Are we ready for tonight? All right. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we do, we do come. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. We enter your courts with praise tonight. We say this is the day that you have made. And we're so thankful. We're so thankful. We're so thankful for what you're doing. For what, you're, uh, what you've done, what you're doing. And what you'll continue to do in our midst. Father, we come into agreement with heaven tonight. We just say heaven rules in this place. And God, we say we honor your presence in the house. Jesus, we honor your presence in the house. Holy Spirit, we honor your presence in the house. And we say do. We say do what pleases the Father's heart tonight. God, we uh, invite that angelic realm tonight. We invite those angels that you have set apart on our behalf. And we just say go. We just say go. We release the angels. Father, we, we, we thank you for that cloud of witnesses that visit us and, and encourage us in where we're going and what we're doing. Father, we thank you for the beauty of Jesus in this place. We thank you that hearts are being touched. Hearts are being touched. Lord, I just speak a release. I speak a release. I saw a heart and arteries this morning. And so I just speak a release to your physical heart, to your spiritual heart. And I just say blood flow, blood flow. No, no hindrance, no hindrance. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we declare we're under the government of God tonight. Under that government and the increase of that peace. And the increase. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the angels that are moving in this place, God. Thank you for the angels that are moving in this place. Thank you for the angels that are moving in this place. You recognize that realm, Lord, tonight. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, we just give a shout out to Jesus tonight. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Woo, woo. Oh. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I've heard some say. Yeah, yeah. But Disneyland is the happiest place on earth. But I say they're wrong. This is the happiest place on earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. So let there be joy. Let there be joy. 
your neighbor and say, you're a revival just waiting to happen. with your fire tonight, Lord. Come on and fill us with your fire. Yeah. And fill us with a burning flame, a burning flame, a burning flame. There's a revival that's burning in me. The word is a lie, and the truth has set me free. A river of fire is about to be released. There's a revival that's burning in me. There's a revival that's burning in me. The word is alive and the truth has set me free. A river of fire is about to be released. Oh. There's a river that's burning in me. It's a fire, it's a fire, it's a fire in my bones. It's a fire, it's a fire, it's a fire in my bones It's a fire, it's a fire, it's a fire in my bones It's a fire, it's a fire, it's a fire in my bones I've got to let it out, yeah let it With a faith to receive Come on Signs that follow Those who will believe There's a river That's burning in me What is it? It's a fire It's a fire It's a fire in my bones It's a fire It's a fire A fire in my bones It's a fire
turn on the radiation Turn on the revelation Light up illumination <laughs> I want to glow in the dark Turn up the radiation Turn on the revelation Light up illumination I want to glow in the dark I want to glow
Let there be a West Coast rumble, rumble, rumble. Holy, holy 
is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Come on. The holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The holy, the holy, yeah, is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let that rise up in you tonight. The whole earth is full of His glory. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Sing it out. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of. of the glory of the Lord is covering Seattle just like the sound is covering the waters are covering the sound oh yes Lord a place where the song doesn't stop going on 24-7 Where elders bow on their knees cast their crowns before the King 24-7 
Creatures sing loud and clear, the voices ring 24 7. And day and night, the angels cry as the sound fills the sky 24 7. Day and night. Day and night, night and day, worship at your throne. Yeah. Day and night, night and day, worship at your throne. We join with heaven day and night, night and day. Day and night, night. Worship at your throne oh, Day and night, night and day Worship at your
Another glimpse, just another glimpse, just another glimpse of your glory, just another glimpse, just another glimpse, just another glimpse of your glory. We are changed, we are changed, we are changed. In an instant, we are changed. We are changed. We are changed. In an instant, every time you appear, every time you appear in your glory, every time you appear. Change. We shall be like you. Oh, because we will see you as you are. We shall be like you. For we will see you as you are.
from you are all things and to you are all things from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory you deserve the glory come on somebody and somebody praise him tonight I know not a lot but I know Jesus him and him crucified you know what America needs Jesus Jesus you know what your family needs not Dr. Phil your family needs Jesus how many of you here tonight you're like I need Jesus tonight Jesus is here tonight why don't you stand up to your feet Jesus, we honor you tonight. We honor your presence and your glory here tonight. We honor who you are. We honor your values and your attributes. We honor the contents of your heart. Tonight we pray the prayer of Jesus. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our prayer tonight, Father, is that it be in Seattle as it is in heaven. Father, we ask for heavenly blueprints, heavenly strategies. Heavenly perspective. We hold this region in our hearts tonight. We say we care. We care about the Pacific Northwest because you care about this great region. We care about the the gender confusion, identity issues in Seattle. We care. We care because you care, Father. We care about the homelessness epidemic in our streets. We care because you care. And we know that there are no homeless in heaven. For everyone that's there has a home. We know, Father, that you have blueprints for Seattle, for this region. You have solutions, heavenly solutions for humanity's problems. And tonight we're gathered with all kinds of churches present, and all kinds of leaders present, and all kinds of families present. And Father, it's our cry that you would honor our request 
for awakening and harvest. That our churches would be full. That our homes would be full. That our barns would be full with harvest. That the schools would be full. That buildings all across the Pacific Northwest would be full of people coming together to celebrate the name of Jesus. Father, your word says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So, Father, we ask that your spirit would come and rest on this region. That there would be liberty in this region. That there would be hope released in this region. Father, we ask that we, the body of Christ, that we'd be oracles of hope. That instead of partnering with fear, instead of partnering with the spirit of the world, with the spirit of religion, that we begin to partner with the Holy Spirit, with the spirit of Christ Jesus, which is the spirit of revival and awakening. And we thank you, Father, for the great shift that's taking place within the church. That there are generations that are emerging and beginning to partner together to see the expression of the kingdom manifest on the earth and we thank you father that the spirit of competition is being purged from the body of Christ and we thank you father that prejudice is being purged from the body of Christ that you're raising up a multi-ethnic co-ed multi-generational people who love Jesus and love people There's just been this message coming out just over the last couple days about God raising up an army. Yes. An army. Our daughter Abigail on Sunday saw like an army being raised up and they had Bibles and they were being led by Jesus on the earth. And then that theme has come up throughout the conference that he's raising up an army. And I believe my daughter got it right. I believe there's a people of God who know the word of God that are following Christ Jesus. And we're, we're doing events, we're collaborating, we're coming together as the family of God, we're worshiping the Lord, we're enjoying His presence, and yet there's this militancy. There is this radical sense of purpose. It's the heart of Christ Jesus that's being awakened in us. That we're no longer just Western American traditional Christians. But we're sons and daughters of God responding to the groaning. Responding to the, to the cry of all creation that the sons and daughters of God would be manifested and revealed. If there's a cry from all creation and from the nations for hope, for righteousness, for things to be made right. How many of you have been watching the news lately and there's something in your soul that just says, man, this just ain't right. And everybody's looking to to, to Trump or they're like Trump's the problem or everybody's looking to, to, to the political sphere right now but here we are tonight and where are we looking we're looking to heaven yeah. David would say it like this I lift my eyes up up to the mountains because that's where my help comes from my help comes from the Lord so would you do me a big favor tonight? I don't have a lot of voice. I've been gangster rapping with Jeremy for the last three days, right? <laughs> would, you, would, you just, would you stand and grab the hand of someone next to you? I want us to pray tonight. I want us to pray for Seattle and the West Coast. I want us to pray that the Psalm 91 refuge place would cover our West Coast. Father, we thank you, God, for this God dream that you have declared, even through Prophet James W. Gall, that the West Coast would no longer be known as the left coast, but the blessed coast. We declare your spirit is at work on this coast. We declare that, that Psalm 91 refuge place, that you're covering us with your wings. We thank you, Father, that no harm shall be able to touch Los Angeles or Seattle. 
We thank you that no, that nothing sent from North Korea shall even arrive anywhere near our shores because we're covered by the Lord. We're covered by the Lord. And we declare tonight we will fear no evil. We will not partner with fear. We will not partner with intimidation. We will not partner with a political spirit. We will partner with the spirit of Christ Jesus. And we say we will fear no evil because he is with us. His rod and his staff, it comforts us. He's preparing for us a table in the presence of our enemies. He's anointing our heads for oil. Our cups are overflowing. And surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we thank you, Father, you're establishing Seattle as a city of hope, as a, as a true city of refuge as a true city of mercy and justice. We thank you, Father. We pray blessing and refreshing for every general, for every pastor, for every intercessor, for every son and daughter in this region, that they'd be strengthened. Strengthened. Squeeze that hand next to you and just say, I declare strength over you. I declare refreshing over you. I declare courage over you. I declare bravery over you. You will not pull back. You will not shrink back. This is your time to arise and shine with the glory of God. We're pressing in. We're pressing in. We are the army of God. We are the army of God. We are the army of God. We're not... Uh, that, that what you see here tonight and throughout the weekend, it's, it's not crazy. It's passion. It's not weirdness. It's passion. There's a passionate people of God that are emerging. Just declare, I will not partner with the spirit of apathy. With a spirit of tiredness, I will not shrink back. I'm making a choice to lift up my voice. I will be an intercessor. I will be a priest. I will be a king. I will stand. I will stand. I will stand firm. I will stand firm. I will stand firm. Having done all, I will stand firm. I will stand firm. I will stay. You are not going down. You ain't about to quit. You ain't about to retire in the kingdom of God. You're coming up into a new place of influence. I will stand firm. I will stand firm. Yeah, all God's people, let them a shout in this place. Did you, did, you know, did you know that when we shout, we break heavy yokes? How many of you, you've had a heavy yoke, you've had some heaviness on you, and some of you, it's like the, the devil's tricked you into thinking it's, it's a good burden that you need to bear, but I'm telling you, some of you need to get some stuff taken off of you tonight. Yep, yep, so on the count of three, we're going we're gonna to lift up a shout of praise. This isn't just shouting. for. I, I have no interest in just generating some hype tonight. But here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to close our eyes, and we're going to forget about the person next to us, and we're going to lift up a shout, not any other, not just, not just some shout. We're going to lift up a shout of victory. Yeah. Because God has a victory agenda for you and your family and this region. And, yep, yeah, and it's going to be not a battle cry. It's a victory cry knowing that Christ Jesus has accomplished our victory on our behalf. And we stand tonight not warring for victory, but from victory. Is that good? And, and, and hold on, and, and, and you might not be feeling it, but this isn't about feelings tonight. This is about faith. This is about you standing and saying, I will, I will make a choice to lift my voice and declare a shout of victory, knowing that Christ Jesus has done it all. He's paid for it all. Is that good? Are you ready? Army of God. Are you ready, you army of God? Come on, one, two, three. Yeah.
Go ahead and put out your hands like this and just say, Father, I receive that kind of joy that brings strength. I receive supernatural joy. <laughs> joy. Uns- wow. <laughs> joy. Whoa. Wow. I receive joy unspeakable and full of glory. I receive it right now. Joy unspeakable. I receive strength throughout my body right now. I receive strength throughout my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions. I receive joy and, and strength even in my spirit, man, right now. Because it's the joy, the joy, it's a, the joy of the Lord. I got the voice of the Lord. Give it a little song, song, Steve. Come on, give us a little song, song. Oh, come on, Steve. Come on. The joy of the Lord is my strength. All right. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Just receive it right now. That's strength. Yeah. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. Right, here comes, here comes. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Ah, ha, 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 Joy, 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 joy. The joy of the Lord oh. is my strength. Come on. The joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah, come on, Jimmy, get up here. Just the, just the drums. Just the drums. Come on, Jerry. Come on. Oh, what, what? Oh, what, what? Yeah. Come on. Here it comes, here it comes, I can sense it's coming. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, come, come, come. We want that joy. We want the joy of the Lord. I'm saying right now, he's releasing the sword. He's coming down tonight because he's in love with you. I'm telling you right now, you said yes, you bit off more than you can chew. Because you don't get to control the fountain. He pours it out and he starts to push the fountain out the room. Because that's what he always does. Because he's coming with that Holy Ghost glory. Words. Oh, oh, it's my strength. Come on. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. Let me tell you about Jesus the Christ. He died on the cross and took my struggle and my strife. And then he gave me the joy of the Lord. I'm telling you right now. Word. Oh. He is my strength. The joy of the Lord. He is my strength. The joy of oh, the oh, hold Lord. Up. Oh, you got some more? Wait, 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 oh, whoa, wait, wait, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up. There's a river in this place. Oh. I think we gotta just take some barrels out. We gotta dip them up in that river. Come on, here we go. A oh, music maestro. Come on, here we go. One, two, whoa! Come on, get. 
at your neighbor. This is a perfect atmosphere for an offering. Uh, tonight, Jeremy Nelson's going to be taking an offering. You may be seated. Give someone a high five and say you're at the right place at the right time. Come on, hit someone and say you're at the right place at the right time. At the right place. Must have been a rap, please. <laughs> I don't have no rap left in me, man. See, it feels better in here already. I mean, you know, every once in a while we do Holy Ghost rap in, uh, you know, San Diego, but every night we're doing it here. But isn't it fun, though? Come on, fun in church. That's supposed to be like common denominator every time because Jesus is fun. Woo! Thank you, Lord. But um, listen, I, I got the uh, honor of taking tonight's offering up or receiving tonight's offering. And I'm just blasted now, so thanks. <laughs> I had this whole message laid out. And uh, no, but um, I want to just talk to you about living in the glory of God. Anybody want to live in the glory? Yeah. Come on, because God's taken us to a new level of his presence. He's taken us to a new level of his, his glory. And also, he's awakening the church to the reality that Holy Spirit is here to stay, you guys. Come on, how many know sometimes we get this thought in our mind that's like, you know, uh, we, we, we get this mindset where we're like, oh, don't pass me by. He ain't passing you by. He lives inside of you and he's upon you. Come on, somebody. How many know John 14? Uh, you know, uh, it's amazing what John says. He says, if you abide in him and you abide in his words, it says that Jesus will pray to the Father and he'll send you another helper, the Holy Spirit. And it says this, that the world does not know him because they cannot see him and, and, and they cannot hear him. But it says that you know him because he dwells in you and upon you. Amen? Amen. Well, listen, I, I, this is an important point because I want you to understand something. You are created for the glory of God. And you're created to carry the glory of God. Not just like a little trickle here, a little goose bump there, a little fire here. I mean, you've got to understand that one of the things I believe God is doing is God is reintroducing himself to the church in this season. I talked about this last night. And, and, and one of the things that I believe God wants to do is he wants to awaken the reality of what it looks like to live in everyday life in fellowship with the presence of God. Amen? Amen. How many know in the Old Testament there was people that had a glimpse of glory that rested upon their lives? Every once in a while there was people that God would mark and they would become judges. They would become those that were deliverers. They would, and, 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 you know, one of the greatest examples of a person who lived under the anointing of the glory was Moses, right? How many remember Moses? And, and, and it was interesting because God raised Moses up in one of the most unusual times in human history because how many, how many know that the Hebrew children were under um, bondage of, of an evil Pharaoh and it was 400 years of bondage, right? So I'm telling you, you want to know why God wants to release his glory? Because he wants to get you straight out of bondage and into breakthrough. Come on. Come on, tell your neighbor straight out of bondage. So I'm going to come straight out of bondage tonight. Because when the glory of God comes, it's a bondage breaker. And what happens is God begins to release miracles. And those miracles begin to be a natural thing. They begin to follow us everywhere that we go. And they begin to manifest. Why? Because God so loves us. Woo! Jesus. <laughs> My gangster rap voice is here too. <laughs> but you know what? It's all good because uh, uh, God wants to bless us and he wants to show us his ways. How many know that the Bible says in the book of Psalms, it says that the, the children of Israel knew God by his signs and wonders, but Moses knew God by his ways. Amen? And so when you begin to know God by his ways, it changes everything. And, and, and so you have to look at Moses' life because I believe he is an example to us of what it looks like to live and move in the glory. And so here you go. You got the Hebrew children, 400 years. They're in slavery. They're in bondage to the uh, Egyptian culture. And what do they do? They begin to cry out. And guess what they hear? Nothing. Anybody feel like that sometimes? God, what's, the, what's going on? Do you see my situation? It's like... You know, and, 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 but yet at the same time, you never know where God's going to bring a deliverer from. And all of a sudden, God speaks to Moses, 
right? And, and, and he encounters them with a burning bush of fire. And here is Moses. He encounters God. And what does God do? He says, I'm raising you up to be a deliverer, to bring my people out of Egypt and into the land of promise, a land that's overflowing with milk and honey. And he tells Moses, he says, listen, I'm going to allow you to plunder Egypt. You're going to plunder Egypt of their gold and their silver articles and their garments. And they're going to be given to the sons and daughters of God. How I many you know that's a pretty good promise, right? Yeah. He's not just promising that you're going to be a little blessed. He's saying you're going to plunder Egypt. You're going to plunder. I I like that word. Just look at your neighbor and go plunder. I mean, no, I didn't say plunger. I said plunder. Come on, because uh, listen, God wants to get rid of stinking thinking because some of us, we got a plunger mindset. God wants to give you a plunder mindset. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and so what happens? Moses has an encounter with God 40 days and 40 nights on, the, on, the, on the, the top of the mountain. And you know what happens is all of a sudden God's glory begins to permeate his life. Listen, we are in a mountaintop week this week. This is a, a, a camp meeting. And, and whenever you have camp meetings, it's like going to the summit with God. And you get in the glory night after night after night. And you ascend that mountain of God. And, 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 and you know what happened on the mountain? He began to be anointed. To the place where he came down off the mountain, he began to shine in the light of the glory. And it's, I believe that it was a picture of what's available to you and I through intimacy and through, through salvation in Christ. That there's a place where the glory of God will rest and remain upon us. And what's amazing is he moved in crazy signs and wonders, but he didn't just move in a little bit. Listen, the glory of God, when it begins to rest on your life, it brings supernatural results. Because when, when, when Moses brought the Hebrew children out of bondage, listen, he brought them out. And, and the Bible says they plundered the Egyptians of their gold and their silver and their, uh, their, their, their clothing, their, their white garments. And they were to be given to the sons and daughters of God. But it was more than gold and silver when they came out of Egypt. Listen, it, there was such an anointing of glory upon an entire generation because one man paid a price to get to know the father one man got into the presence of god's glory and and all of a sudden the glory of god rested upon a whole generation and you got to understand that 3.2 million people came out of egypt and there was no lack listen their clothes did not wear out i mean like uh, their shoes lasted i mean they didn't have uh, i mean you got to understand they didn't have they didn't have versace they had god sachi you know like nothing ever wore out i mean i made that up but it sounds pretty good I mean, they had such a glory resting on them. You've got to understand that not one was feeble, not one was sick amongst them. Do you realize what that means? Do you realize what happens when the glory of God starts to rest upon a person and starts to, uh, when you start to carry glory? Uh, I mean, listen, the word glory, and it means this in the Hebrew, doxa, which means honor. And, and, and you've got to understand, when you honor the presence of God and His glory rests upon you, it, listen, it means that you're a friend of God and you're a steward of the things of God's heart. And then all of a sudden what He does is in turn, He honors you because you honor Him. And all of a sudden the glory of God starts to release a miraculous realm around you. And you know what's amazing is, is this is what happens. They come out of the wilderness and, 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 and they, they, or they come out of Egypt and, and they come out and not one of them is sick. Not one of them is feeble amongst them. I mean, you want to talk about reformation, you guys. There are three million people in San Diego. This would be like at one moment of time, every person in the city is healed. And you've got to understand the provisionary realm that came upon the church in that moment because they're in the wilderness. And, and, and listen, woo, I, I'm telling you, they had it made in the shade. Literally, there was a cloud that floated over them. And there was a fire that appeared in the desert. Listen, I grew up in Grand Junction, Colorado. It's kind of like a desert valley. And, and I'll tell you, it gets freezing cold at night. But you know what? God provided for them Holy Ghost heater, all right? In the midst of the camp, he was the flame. And, 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 and when it was super hot, he would bring that cool, I, I mean, that cool breeze, that, that, that cloud covering. And then when they needed water, it would come supernaturally out of a rock. I mean, like, and, but, but think about this. It, it says in the, in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, that they would wake up in the morning and that quail would come out of the heavens. And it was, it was literally, it looked, like the, it looked like a cloud coming down. And, and they would just open the door and it would be right there. I mean, they didn't have to do anything. 
And they had manna that would came that they would come every day. And I studied this out. And, and, and I looked up what, how much manna would come for 3 million people to have a meal. Did you know that on a daily average, there was 110 boxcar train size amounts of, of, of manna that would come from heaven? And guess what? On the, the day of rest, there was two times that that would come. See, we think too small sometimes. And I'll tell you what, we, the reason why we don't see these breakthroughs is because we're lacking one thing. And I'll tell you what it is. We're trying to, we're, we're, we're trying to do everything without the presence of God. See, the glory of God, when it comes upon someone's life, is an accelerator. And it accelerates every place that the, that the Lord wants to prosper. He wants to anoint. And, and listen, you say the word prosper nowadays. That's like a dirty word in some circles. And I'll just tell you right now, as a leader, I repent to you for those that have misused, who have abused, who have been, you know, those that, that, that have manipulated to use the gospel for, per, for personal gain. But, but we got to overcome that because we're coming to a place now where we're going to take cities, we're going to take nations, we're going to transform regions. But I'll tell you what, you're crazy if you think you're going to do it without this Without the glory of God See, there's a lot of people trying to reform all kinds of things And they're frustrated because they're not able to do it right now Why? Because they need a blueprint from heaven did you know most of you in this room are created for something that does not exist yet? And we're in a season right now where out of the manifest presence of God, He's releasing blueprints. He's releasing anointing. He's releasing glory. He's releasing breakthrough. And what He's looking for is a people who will value His presence more than anything. And I'm telling you, a year and a half ago, my wife, we, we got messed up. <laughs> Just like you. And, and I'm telling you, I had 39 trips to go on last year, 2015, 14 nations. And, and, and I'm telling you, God busts out in the manifest presence of God in a weekend. And the Lord says to me, will you cancel it all for me? You have to understand that was my livelihood. That's all I've known for 12 years, traveled to 54 nations. And, 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 and I felt the Lord say, I want you to sow everything, all of your relationships, all of your, your finances, all of your time, and just host my presence continually with 200 people a night. And I was like, what? You know, I'm like, God, I'm supposed to preach in Taiwan with Papa Che at the uh, major apostolic gathering with thousands of people. Like, and he's like, and, and, and the Lord told me, he, he, said, he said, listen, your generation has to learn to host and honor the presence. He said, if you honor my presence, he said, I will honor you. That's what the Lord told me. And you know what's amazing is we were $100,000 in debt at the very beginning of the outpouring. We began to honor God. He paid that $100,000 off. And now we're, we're, we're like so far ahead, it's crazy. And what's amazing is now we're actually seeing the favor of God come for lands, buildings. I mean, listen, I got land given to us from in Australia. We got land given to us in uh, South Africa. And now we're, 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 we're pressing in. And, and this week we close on a miracle building that, um, that, that we're getting the Amy Simple. Mick Fearson preached at, Smith Wigglesworth, 100,000 people uh, were saved in, in you know, the, the Jesus people movement in this revival well. And what's amazing is when the revival started, we were in the north of San Diego, way far off, and I feel like we're in an Obed-Edom season for the start of the revival. But now, like David, we're taking the ark to the city of David. See, God is about to take movements from the fringe and put them right in the midst of cities. And see, we're in a shift right now where we're going from a Moses generation to a Joshua generation. And I'm telling you, the finances are not going to be an issue because what God is about to do is he is about to uh, release his trust over a generation. And for those that have valued his presence, for those that value his glory. Listen, that, that realm of Doxa, that realm of Shekinah, that realm of, of uh, you know, Kabod glory is going to rest on your life. And, 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 and I'll tell you, uh, the reason why we haven't seen the breakthroughs is on a large scale. We've had breakthroughs here, breakthroughs there, and, and, and uh, is because uh, uh, we've tried to do things out of our own strength instead of out of God's strength. And see, I believe in this outpouring here so much. I love it because there's different kinds of outpourings. Moran and I, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like we're a, we're a parachurch ministry that blew into revival and now we're getting our own building and we have like seven or eight churches that are like, hey, we'll jump in with you. And we even have a local church in the building that's renting from us and we have about 13 businesses that are in there. 
And we're going from like hosting nightly meetings to like full on an apostolic center with a business model that, I mean, like, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, and I'm going, God, how did I even get here? And he said, oh, I could trust you with my presence, so I can trust you with more. Amen. See, people that say, we don't need those nightly meetings. We don't need revival. They, they don't understand the power of his presence because his presence leads to friendship. Friendship leads to trust. Trust leads to breakthrough. Breakthrough leads to delivering cities, delivering nations. Oh. oh. And so we're going to receive an offering tonight. And we're going to sow into the glory of God that's been being released here for a year and a half, you guys. Because here's what makes revival revival. Manifest presence. Listen, I'm telling you, you could not make people come to church for a year and a half uh, if you put a gun to them. It just wouldn't happen. But you know what? They'll come when God's in the house. And you have to understand that when God's in the house, the same thing that happened to Moses on the mountain. How many know he had, a, he had an extended time and season, 40 days, 40 nights, where he was exposed to the manifest glory. And that, that, that extended season and a couple other extended seasons led to the deliverance of a whole generation. See, I look around the room right now and I see reformers and I see revivalists and I see people right now who are catching blueprints, who are actually catching the actual realm of trust and friendship with God. And as we go after his presence in this generation, we will see the greatest victories we've ever seen. And, and, and the other thing that I'm telling you is the family aspect. Fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, grandfathers, grandmothers. It's not about one generation doing it all. How I many know that Moses and Joshua ran together? And the inheritance came to the children's children. Listen, we are in a season of inheritance. And, and, and you know, I honor Papa Che and, and Mama Sue. I, I honor even the revival that's happened here in this place before with, with your father. I mean, listen, there's, there's moves of the Spirit that have already happened. But listen, God wants us to redig the wells. And He wants us to begin to establish new wells. And here's the beautiful thing. A wise king puts on display both treasures of old and treasures of new. And one's not better than the other. And you know what? I believe we're in a season where momentum's coming, where we won't lose, the, we won't lose anything of the best of the old. We're going to run with that generationally together, and we're going to push into the new, and it's going to break through. But one thing I do know the Lord said to me is we see in part and we prophesy in part. And, and, and we're in a season right now where I believe that what we're all created for, it's not even here yet, you guys. We're starting to get glimpses, but it's not even here yet. But you know what? That makes me excited because we can push in and we can receive from God blueprints. And, okay, i got to stop. It's not my night to preach. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, <laughs> Listen, we're going to sow into the glory of God tonight. And I want you to understand something. When we honor the presence of the Lord, when we build his house, how many know he'll build ours? I'm talking to pastors and leaders. I'm talking to business people. I'm talking to families, you know. And, and, and sometimes what happens is we get so caught up in the politics of church that we begin to re really lose sight. I mean, we get so caught up, wow, it's only 10%. Listen, it's your whole life, you guys. And, and here's why we give. We give because we honor the Lord. And I believe tonight as we honor the Lord, the breaker anointing and even the, the, the testimonies of what I'm talking about where I mean listen personally we went from in debt like running around you know like a, a chicken with your head cut off trying to pay the bills to like now we're, we're getting a building now we have you know interns we have churches that we're connected with we're seeing other outpourings break open and, and I'm telling you it, it, it's all been miraculous as we've just loved on Jesus in his presence and I believe that in this place, there's a Daniel company that's coming. I prophesied it this morning. And there's, there's a move of the Spirit that's here, but there's also going to be the spreading out there. And so I'm telling you, you're going to want to sow into what God is doing here in the ground floor, you guys. And as you do, you're going to reap. Woo, I'm telling you, who wouldn't have wanted to sow into Amazon in the ground floor? <laughs> Right? Or, or I'm telling you, you know, Apple or whatever. And, and so, listen, I want you to just say, Holy Spirit. What do you want me to sow tonight? And be radically obedient to him because that's how it works. And you know what? When you're radically obedient to God, it's out of relationship that you give. And out of relationship, how could God not bless what you do? And, and, and so uh, if you need an envelope, um, you know, I'm sure there's ushers that will come around and give you those.
Uh, raise your hands if you need that. Uh, you, you can, woo, Jesus, you can give. Now I'm starting to get whacked. <laughs> You can give online. Um, if you're watching online, you can also text to give. Ha, ah, Jesus. You can text to give. Thank you, Lord. Woo! Ah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord, for the wine offering. Ha. Ah. Ah. Woo, Jesus. You can get ready. Make your checks out to Seattle Revival Center or SRC. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and whenever you're ready, oh man, <laughs> whenever you're ready, you can come up and so, and we'll play, uh, we'll play, <laughs> we'll, we'll pray, pray. <laughs> we'll pray a blessing over every seed. Come on, I believe there's a generation whom the glory of God's going to rest upon. A generation that's going to see the supernatural provisions. A generation that's going to see cities healed. for every seed that's sown in this place. Lord, for those online that are giving tonight, God. And Lord, I thank you that as we honor your presence, Lord God, as we honor your glory, Lord, I thank you that breakthrough happens, God. Lord, I thank you that every spirit of poverty, Lord, every assignment of the enemy that tries to hinder the flow of breakthrough in our lives with our finances, God, every debt, Lord, every place, Lord God, where, where, where there's lack and even where there's fear, God, and hope deferred, I thank you, Lord, that right now it breaks in this place, God. And Lord, I pray that the glory of God would mark people's lives, that the glory of God would mark people's hearts, and that you'd raise up a generation, God, who loves and values your presence more than anything else in life. In Jesus' name. Come on, give God a hand. <laughs> wow. Okay. Just a couple practical things that we're going to get right and keep going, okay? Um, I always say that, and I try hard. Um, okay, so if you have kids with you, we're just asking you to keep them with you, right? Because it can get really crazy in here at night, and um, we don't want them out in the hallway or by themselves, and so if you could just keep them with you, that would be great. And another thing is we have a, a ministry team that's been trained up in this house and that carries in their spirit what is going on in this house. So we would ask that you would um, respect that as well. And so if you're not part of the house or that ministry team, that if you wouldn't pray for others. And that's not because you don't know how to pray. You're all able ministers of the gospel, and we realize that. But we also realize that God's doing something unique here. And so we're, um, we value that so much that we want to protect you so you can come in and receive everything that God has for you. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, great. And... Um, so I just, want to, I just want to put out one encouragement um, to consider, if you haven't come to, to be in, in the house for the camp meeting yet, that you consider coming. There's, um, there's a rumble that you can feel in the atmosphere that started the f first... <laughs> That's going to help. <laughs> that started the first meeting, and, and it's increasing with every meeting. This morning's meeting was like uh, nothing I've ever experienced. It was, it was so full... It was just so full of heaven that um, it, it, you hardly knew what to do. <laughs> I mean, I did. So all I'm saying is, if you want, if your heart's yearning for the things that the ministers have been bringing, have been declaring what Jeremy just declared and what, and what has come in worship, if you're hungry for those things, you need to come. Okay? And not just this week, but you know what? We, we are stewarding 
to the best of what God shows us what he's doing here. And so we, um, after camp meeting, we're taking another break till mid-September. But then we start up again with a, a lineup of, of people that we believe the Lord has brought here for the purpose of what he's doing here. So we don't take that lightly either. We don't, you know, we're not, you know, putting ads out in the paper kind of deal. <laughs> you know? we, we know that God's doing it. And then after the first of the year, we're going to have a West Coast Rumble of our own. Woo! West Coast Rumble Conference in January. Right? And then we're going to do another declaration conference in February. So I'm putting that out there that so you see that we take this seriously and we also know that this is for the long haul. We're not going anywhere. We're just obeying God to the best of our ability and taking a rest. That's why we had a rest last month. We're going to take another rest before we start in September um, because wis it takes wisdom to run the long race. So that's what we're doing, and we, and we invite you to come and join us. So if your heart hungers for the things that you're hearing declared here, then come and join us. We'd love to have you. Um, gosh, that's, that's about enough, wouldn't you say? So good. How do you know that the gift of administration is a spiritual gift? Absolutely. And so uh, we, we, we just... We, we honor and love our, our administrators and those who are running here at Sierra Vial Center with the gift of administration. That would be, of course, Jeanette and Linda Boone and, uh, and Pastor Keith Webb. Just uh, absolutely a dream team here at SRC. And just love you guys. Appreciate you. Honor you. And Michelle Tibbs, of course. Michelle Tibbs as well. You guys are in for a real treat. And I just, I just, want, to, I just want to say a big thank you to Steve Swanson for coming and being here this whole week. Leading us in worship. You, 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 you. He is the man. I, I mean, uh, I, I mean, man, I, my, my prayer is that God just so blesses Steve's socks off, Steve and his wife. That, man, you are just, ah, I just love this guy. And, and, and this is like a birthday gift. This is like a birthday gift to me having Steve here this, this whole week. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it literally was your birthday. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Man, I just got so whacked this morning. Uh, this morning was just off the charts, off the charts. Come on, come on. Um, okay, so how many of you, actually, this is your first time here tonight. You've actually never been here before. Wave at wave me. Oh, wow, lot, lots of hands. All right, God bless you. Welcome. It, it, it's, our, it's, our, our, it's our hope that you um, just feel at home tonight. So it's good to have you here. Um, you know, Seattle's kind of a weird place. Um, Seattle, we're known for being really reserved. You know, like, um, you know, on, on the roads, you know, on 405 and I-5, no one honks their horns. You know, nobody honks. Everyone's very polite. Everyone keeps to themselves. You know, in, in Seattle, nobody talks to their neighbors until, um, until June. And then we hang out with our neighbors until... The end of August, I literally tell my neighbors in September, goodbye, have a good winter, and I will see you in the spring. And they're like, okay, sounds good. And that's literally, you know, don't judge me, but I mean, that's how it is for most of us in Seattle. We're, we tend to be quiet, reserved, respectable kind of thing. Until, okay, until you go to a Seahawks game. When you go to a football game, we break all the world records for the loudest stadium in the United States, right? Like the decibel. So there's this weird thing. Football has become an outlet for people. Like, like it's like, you know, and, and like it, it really has. It, it's actually a full-on religion. Absolutely, sure is. Um, <laughs> yeah. So enough about football. But here, here's the thing. I think oftentimes within the church... That when so like it's funny like you'll hear these testimonies where um, the interns you know they prayed for how many people just the other day thirty five people and they led a, a, a Sikh man to the Lord if you don't know that like that's a big deal and see so um, now here here so and how many people did they lead to the Lord that day do you remember twelve people accepted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior okay. stop stop stop. Stop, 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 stop. Okay, listen. Twelve people, they were previously not going to heaven. Okay, so here's part of the deal is oftentimes a lot of us, we celebrate stuff in the church as if it's a golf game. When, when, when somebody nails it, when somebody just absolutely stinking nails it at a golf game, how do people respond? Woo! No.
And what's interesting is that like 13 people gave their lives to Jesus. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So we got this prophetic word about a West Coast rumble, and we, we believe that there's a prophetic activation that, that when, when something begins to resonate in our hearts, here at Seattle Revival Center, we begin to actually literally begin to rumble the building. And the, and the way that we do it is we use our feet. We begin to literally rumble the ground, and the ground begins to resonate with corporate excitement. And so, yep, yep, yep. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So I was preaching last Sunday, and I'd been gone for a little bit, right? Um, uh, and, and I'd forgotten, actually, about the rumble. And all of a sudden, I said something, and the rumble had, took place. And I was like, it actually scared me. I thought we were having an earthquake for a second. And I was like, well, I was like, did you guys hear that? And then, I, and then they were like, and a bunch of people started laughing. I realized, oh, that, oh yeah, I'm, I'm at home. I was like, that was, and somebody yelled, it was the rumble. And then the whole place took off rumbling. And so um, I, the reason why I share all that with you is because a lot of you, this isn't necessarily your home church but, or whatever, but I, I don't want you to act tonight like you're in a church service. I want you to act like you're actually a part of something that's a little bit more exciting than young men in tights throwing around a football. I want you to actually act like tonight you're a part of this huge kingdom dynamic where God's actually moving on the face of the earth. And when something begins to resonate in your heart, let's let it resonate in this room. Yeah, come on now. Let me hear you. Let me hear you. Let me hear you. Come on, get that rumble going. Oh, 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 oh. And take the rumble back home to your home church. I'm sure everyone will appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, I mean, let's begin to really celebrate. Let's, a, a culture of celebration is the culture of heaven. Absolutely. So let's really, let's, let, let's, 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 let's just start to engage with the heavenly, with the angelic, when, when something begins to happen um, in, in a room. Now, enough about that. Enough protocol stuff. All right. Now, now you know how to, how to party here. Okay. Um, tonight's very, very significant. Uh, from 1994 to 1997, three pastors from three different denominations, three different churches began coming together to host the presence of the Lord, and it became known as Seattle Revival Center. Seattle Revival Center was not a local church. It was, it was, a, it was three autonomous churches that began hosting the presence of the Lord together. There was Wayne Anderson from the International Church, and Steve Richard from, the, from uh, Freedom Life Foursquare, and then my dad, an Assembly of God pastor, and for three years... Um, uh, uh, the churches would worship autonomously on Sunday mornings, and then when their Sunday morning services were over, we would come here and worship together on Sunday mornings with a second Sunday morning service. And then every weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, we would host the presence of the Lord. And then we'd do usually a conference once a month. And it was a wonderful time of the presence. And then that, 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 that season came to an end at the end of 1997. Now, during that time, um, there, were these, there were all these people that came through here. Guys like Bill Johnson, John or not, um, and guys like Che On. Che On was like a regular here back, back in the day. And, um, and, but, but then that season kind of came to an end. And we had our own kind of story here. But these guys continued to host the presence of the Lord. And, and the Lord established um, a Bill Johnson and, and, and Redding there as this apostolic center to the world, beginning to bring this revival culture and a model for sustainable revival to the world. And then the Lord established John and Carol or not with the Toronto um, Airport Christian Fellowship Church as this, as this center of the Father's blessing and put it on display for the world. And then the Lord took um, uh, uh, Che and established him as a Papa to nations. Um, I, I was just at uh, this incredible um, uh, 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 conference um, Called H I M, and this is uh, this is this is a network that uh, that Che established. And so Che was sharing, and, and he said, "Some people call me doctor because I have my doctorate. Some people call me apostle because I had that call." He goes, and some people call me Papa. He goes, and, and he goes, it's not about titles. You just call me wh however you see me and honor me. And, and what's so interesting is that during the 90s, um, Che postured himself as a Papa to nations. And when some were establishing 
ministries, Che was establishing a movement. He had this heart to see a revival dynamic that would lead to reformation, and he's still calling that, he's still carrying that call to this day. So his heart is to run with people who have a heart for the presence and, and give language to a new move of God that will catalyze a reformation within the culture, and I stink and love that. But I think the big deal is, is that um, this place actually went down from this incredible revival dynamic to about 20 people. And there was, there was a, a, a resistance that came to snuff out the call to be a revival center in this region. And it almost took place. And then the Lord called my pastor, Pastor Gail, who is this wild revivalist, to actually come and be a pastor. And she came and she began serving and loving the, ch- the sheep. And I found myself coming back. I thought, all, I thought it was over. I thought it was over for, I thought all the prophetic words I'd ever received were flushed down the toilet. I thought, well, here we go. I was done with the church and all this stuff. And, 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 and look around you tonight. Here we are, 18 months of hosting the presence every single weekend, hosting conferences. And, and this is what I think is so amazing. That Papa Che, who used to come, it was a regular kind of face and, and, and person here during the nights. He's here tonight, and I think that's such a radical testimony of God's heart for restoration, that he is the God that makes all things new. And so it's so beautiful what God is doing on the earth, and it's such an honor to have a Papa in the faith. Would you welcome tonight Papa Che on? Come on. so much. You may be seated. Thank you so much. What an honor it is for me to be here. And um, I have just fond memories of the 90s as the Holy Spirit fell in Toronto. And uh, what you may not know, it fell also in Los Angeles at John Wimber's uh, Healing Conference January uh, 25th. It began and uh, Lou and I were attending the conference with around 4,000 people. And, uh, you know, one thing about being part of the Jesus People Movement and the Charismatic Renewal, and, of course, John Wimber was my mentor at Fuller Seminary when I went there in the 80s, we never experienced uh, holy laughter. And I remember uh, John Wimber got up the first night of the conference with around 4,000, and he said, we've been hearing reports about how the Holy Spirit is falling in Toronto. And the same thing happened in our church this past Sunday. We were sending out around 20 young people to go on a short-term mission trip to New Zealand, And as we were praying for them to send them out, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and they got drunk, and they were laughing for almost two hours. And he's saying, this is not normal for us. So it just happened on a Sunday night. We're hearing about what's going on in Toronto. So he said, fasten your seatbelt because we think something's going to happen at this conference. And sure enough, the worship began, and don't you appreciate uh, Steve and his worship, by the way? It's good to see you, Steve. It's great to be with you again. But uh, as the worship began, around 20 minutes into worship, all of a sudden... Laughter started to hit one section at a time. No one's preaching. It's just worship. And I don't even pick it up. I don't even discern this, but Lou Engel is discerning. He's a prophet. So he nudges me and said, Che, the laughter is spreading throughout the auditorium and it's coming towards us. (laughs) And I said to him, well, I'm not going to laugh. And, uh, you know, I just received my doctorate at Fuller Seminary, so this is what a doctor will do. I said, this is called sociological proof. I had a sociological terminology for it. It's called social proof. So I said, I'm not going to laugh. And I was really not in a good place, okay, I have to be honest with you, because I was debating whether I should quit the ministry. And uh, because uh, I was just struggling financially, uh, I was itinerating. And if you're not well known and you're itinerating, you're not supporting. I had four kids. And, um, and so I was really, really struggling. And I'm saying, you know, I spent all this money on a doctorate. And and yet we're just not making ends meet. And so I was thinking about going into the marketplace. But the laughter was coming towards us, and I said to Lou, I'm not going to laugh, but you know, when it got to our section, and we're in the balcony with 4,000 people, all of a sudden I felt myself getting inebriated, and everything was funny. I mean, I didn't want to laugh, because I didn't want to give Lou the pleasure of laughing, you know? <laughs> so I'm holding my hand over my mouth, and, but I just couldn't help laughing. Every person looked so funny. And there was a guy in front of me who was bald. And forgive me for those who are bald, but his bald head looked so funny. Total stranger, I leaned over and I started to massage his head. (laughs) And he didn't care because he was drunk as well. 
And we fell on the floor and just rolling in between the seats. And it was like 20 minutes of this holy laughter. And when it subsided, I realized my depression was gone. I was depressed as a pastor. And uh, I didn't realize it, but I was depressed. It just broke off of me. And I said to Lou, I said, this is the river of God. Immediately, I, I picked up revival, even though the manifestation was new, because we never experienced holy laughter before. But I said, this is the river of God. I said, Lou, we need to make a covenant right now to jump in the river and stay in the river. What am I talking about? Ezekiel 47, the angel leads Ezekiel into a river that's flowing from Jerusalem into the Dead Sea. It's a spiritual metaphor. There's no literal river flowing from the Dead Sea to uh, from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea. I said, Lou, uh, this is the river of God we need to jump in because the angel leads Ezekiel into, as you remember the story, ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep. And by the way, even when you're waist deep, you still have control. You can wait out. But it leads him into a river that's so deep, the current's so strong, he can't even swim across it. He's lost control. The point being is, is that God is saying, I want my church back. I want you as an individual to totally surrender to my presence. And so we made that commitment. I didn't know what I was committing myself to, but I said, we're going to jump in the river and allow the river to take us. See, the key to success is not for you to do your own thing and ask God to bless it. It's to flow in the river, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you. Jesus said this way in John 5, 19, I only do what I see the Father do. How many know the Holy Spirit is God? Am I preaching to the right group here? How many you know God is always successful? And so when you're in the river of God and allow the river to lead you, it's absolutely amazing and stunning to see what the Lord has done in 23 years. We started to move into nightly meetings, like Seattle up here, and at Mount Auditorium. And, and how many have been down to Pasadena? Any of you been down to Pasadena? Okay, so we hosted the Holy Spirit um, five nights a week for three and a half years from 1995 to 1998. And the only reason why we stopped is because then in 1999, the Lord spoke to Lou to take this to Washington, D.C. for the call prayer movement and to, you know, we were nobody, no one knew us, but the Lord told us to mobilize young people to pray and fast for America. Yeah. So in 1999, we got that vision and started in 2000, we started to mobilize. And uh, what amazed us, by 10 o'clock in the morning, 400,000 young people had gathered together in Washington, D.C. Mall. And based on history, that was the largest youth prayer gathering yeah. to date. By the way, there's another call coming for the ladies, for the Deborahs and Esthers coming up October 9th. I want to make that announcement before I forget. And so it is for everyone, but especially for the ladies to come together to pray and fast for revival and reformation. It says, ask for rain in the latter rain. Anyway, it's such an honor to be here, and I am so proud of Jeremy and Darren, Angela, because people who hosted the Holy Spirit of my generation were the boomers, you know, it was our generation, John or not. Uh, John Kirkpatrick and yeah. Steve Hill in Brownsville. And, uh, and there were other places, and some places like Seattle, and uh, just being here, some of the names you mentioned, I just said, man, it just brings back so uh, many wonderful memories of coming up here. And uh, this was a spot where I, I just want to honor you and your dad for hosting the Holy Spirit. He just went for it. And, um, and I remember just saying that this was, in, in my estimation, and, and I've been walking with the Lord 44 years. I got saved in 73 during the Jesus People Movement and um, experienced that revival. It was part of the charismatic renewal, which actually began in the 50s, 58, with, um, with uh, Dennis Bennett in Van Nuys uh, as an Anglican. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. And by the way, people thought that was a counterfeit revival because especially from the Assembly of God in Fort Square, they could not believe an Anglican that smoked cigarettes would get baptized in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and by the way, he got delivered from cigarettes, okay, when he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, he experienced incredible visitation and the charismatic renewal was on. And so having that kind of history and being with John Wimber, we saw signs of wonders in church growth, but never did I see power like I saw in 94 with the Toronto outpouring to this day. I mean, you cannot touch a person. If you touch them, you would go flying and they would go flying. Amen. I mean, the first time I went to Toronto was October 94. I walked in there to the Regal Constellation Ballroom, but I left crawling out. I could not walk. And thank God my hotel was, at this, uh, the ballroom of the hotel was where the meeting was. I'm just crawling on all four, going into the elevator, pushing, and going to my bedroom, putting the key. That's how I left Toronto. 
No exaggeration. I want to walk, but I couldn't walk. <laughs> so, and, uh, and so to see the next generation of revivalists take the baton, for the first time we have the next generation hosting nightly meetings, both in San Diego, but of course here as well on weekends and the conferences. It's just amazing. So we're cheering you on. We're so proud of you guys. So we're just saying go for it. And, and um, you know, it's, it is true. It's Joshua as well as Moses. It's two generations as Elijah, Elijah, uh, contending for the things of God. So what a privilege to be here. Um, I do want to say this. So we're just talking about, I was talking to um, one of our uh, prophets in HIM and I don't want to give his name because he said something very interesting because we're talking about church history and he said every 10 years there seems to be a visitation since 1948 and we were talking about that in 1948 there was a visitation called the Latter Rain Movement how many of you heard of the Latter Rain Movement North Batterford Canada the Holy Spirit fell and it spread to the Pacific Northwest primarily and for example the uh, the City Bible Church and Portland uh, City Church uh, really was birthed out of the latter rain uh, outpour. Dick Iverson, leaders like that were part of that uh, revival. It goes down to the Kite Leeds in Oakland area. And just amazing leaders who love the Holy Spirit. And a lot of truths like uh, the fivefold ministry got restored. And we take that for granted. But back in those days, no one taught that apostles and prophets were for today. Still, the church has a hard time with apostles and prophets today. But we have to understand in 48, that truth was part of the latter rain outpouring. And with every move, there's also a release of revelation. Can I hear an amen? amen? And so the Holy Spirit's speaking constantly. We just have to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. And then 58, I've mentioned Dennis Bennett and the charismatic movement. 67, Costa Mesa with Chuck Smith and Lonnie Frisbee. Historically, it was the beginning of the Jesus People movement. And that went from 67 to 77. And then right after that, you have what's called the third wave with John Wimber. And, um, and he brought a massive revival. I mean, places like Holy Trinity Brompton was just a nice church. But when John Wimber went there, the Holy Spirit fell. And now they have the Alpha Courses that's teaching about being baptized in the Holy Spirit globally. But that came out of an Anglican church that experienced the Holy Spirit's power through John Wimber. And then, of course, 1994, you have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, in Toronto. So he said something. He said, we have not seen anything in 2000, the decade of 2000, and now 2017. And I said, I beg to differ with all due respect. I mean, he's, a, he's part of HIM. He's part of the uh, uh, leadership of HIM. He's a prophet. And I said, I believe the Holy Spirit fell. We just have to recognize. How many of you know that there could be a major visitation right next door to you and you don't even recognize there's a visitation? They say during the Welsh Revival in 1904, Moriah Chapel, where the Welsh Revival began, right next to the Welsh Revival at Moriah Chapel, was Peter Price's church. It was the mega church of that time. It was the evangelical church of that time. And Peter Price says that's a counterfeit revival, so the Holy Spirit fell on the whole nation but bypassed Peter Price's church, which is scary. I mean, the Pharisees are in the temple praying send the Messiah, send the Messiah, and Jesus is walking right by. And no wonder Jesus weeps and says, you missed the day of your visitation. I wish I could have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her chick, but you're not willing. And he weeps and says, you missed the day of visitation. That scares me. I don't want to see a visitation taking place, and we miss it. And so I had to explain to him, I think the center of gravity shifted from Toronto to Bethel and Reading. They've been in revival and I feel we're still in revival in Pasadena. So to say there's no hot spot in the decade of the 2000s, I disagree. Right. Right. Yeah. And so he said, what about now? I said, San Diego. Yeah. Yeah. I said, Azusa now. I mean, we had a call yeah. last year. How many of you were at Azusa now or you saw it online? Okay, just a handful of you. But you know, 65,000 yeah. people yeah. showed up in the LA Coliseum yeah. on the 110th anniversary of uh, the Azusa Street Revival, which broke out in 1906, April the 9th. By the way, you know, it's just been amazing because that prophetic word was from Smith Wigglesworth, and during that building where Smith Wigglesworth preached. And he said, 110 years after the outpouring in Azusa Street will begin the greatest revival that America has ever seen. So 110 years. That's why Lou intentionally got the L.A. Coliseum on April the 9th, which was a Saturday. Uh, this uh, last year, 2016. But let me give you another prophetic word. 
Lauren Cunningham, how many of you have heard of Lauren Cunningham? Lauren Cunningham is the founder of Youth with a Mission. He's uh, now in his 80s. He's, uh, he came to speak at our church in 2015. And, um, you know, it was such an honor because I, you know, I've been with him in conferences, speaking at conferences with him, but never had him in our church. I've invited him a number of times. He could never make it, but he finally came. So he begins by sharing a vision he had in 2014. So we're talking about this 2015. He shares the vision he had the year before. And he said, now I need to qualify myself because when I talk about a vision, I've only had two open visions in 60 years of walking with the Lord. So we're not talking about just getting this impression and, you know, a lot of us see things and I don't know about you, but, you know, right now the number 222 is major for me and I'm seeing it wherever I go. In other seasons, like 555, grace, grace, grace. And so, you know, you see things and you see things in spirit, but he was talking about an open vision. And he said the first vision was uh, the vision to, to start youth with a mission, YWAM. The second vision happened in January of 2014, where I saw a tsunami wave hit the west coast of America. And it covered the whole United States and covered the whole globe. I said, what is this, Lord? And he said to me, this will be the greatest revival, the greatest awakening America has ever experienced. Now, you've got to take that in conjunction with James Gall's word about the West Coast rumble, what's going on in San Diego here in, uh, in Seattle and Los Angeles. We have to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. So I believe that we're in a huge wave, a next wave of revival, like it comes every 10 years. And, um, and so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about revival. I want to talk about what does revival really look like from a historic perspective? I'm a historian. I was a history major at the University of Maryland uh, when I grew up. You know, it's amazing because um, you know I should either be dead or in prison because um, you know I was a drug addict, and many of you know my testimony. I was a high school dropout actually. I dropped out at the age of 17. By the way, if you're an Asian, the unpardonable sin is dropping out of high school. Okay, <laughs> the whole purpose of immigrating to the United States is to get an education, right? And so my father was the first Southern Baptist pastor in North America in 1958. That's what opened the door for us to immigrate to the United States. And I thank God every day that I'm a citizen of the United States. How many know this is the best country in the world? I've been to over 77 nations. And there's no nation like the United States, regardless of all the politics and all the problems and all that, it's still the best nation. When I fly into Los Angeles, I say, Lord, thank you that I live here in the United States and I'm a U.S. citizen. I mean, you know, we're dual citizens, right? Citizens of heaven, and, yeah. and that takes priority, but still we're, we have to be uh, honoring our nation as well. So my dad came, and uh, we grew up in Washington, D.C., because the church that uh, wanted uh, a Baptist pastor was in Washington, D.C. The Korean government had sent some of their top students out to the Korean War to help rebuild Korea. So the Korean War is from 1950 to 53. And so in 1958, my dad came, and they had uh, just a handful of uh, uh, international top students from South Korea studying at Georgetown University in George Washington on public policy and how to rebuild Korea. And so they wanted a pastor, and my dad went there. But back in those days, there were only maybe 200 Asian uh, Koreans in Washington, D.C. Now if you go there, it's 200,000, if not more. Back in those days, in my, my elementary school, Forest Grove Elementary School in Montgomery County, Maryland, there were no blacks, no Hispanic, and the only Asians were my sister and me, were the only two that broke the color barrier. So all white school. Now, if you go to Seattle, you're in any school, you're, if you're white, you're in the minority, okay? <laughs> I mean, the demographics have changed so much dramatically in cities like Seattle and Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. But back in the 60s, it was all white. And how many know kids are going to let you know how different you are? Yeah. How many know there's no racism in heaven, but there's still racism on earth? Yeah. You know? And so we experienced it. And they called me chink, even though I'm not Chinese. They called me Jap, even though I was Japanese. By the way, we know how to tell the difference, okay? Because I see some Koreans here. Can I give you some cross-cultural lessons so you can discern between the Chinese and Japanese? It's really, really, really simple. If you see a, a rich-looking Asian, they're Chinese. If you see a smart-looking Asian, they're Japanese. But if you see a handsome-looking Asian, he's Korean. So that's how you tell the difference. It's very, very simple. 
I'm joking. I, I grew up so insecure because I stood out and I wanted to be accepted. I got in fights all the time. And um, it's amazing because I had the gift of leadership back then. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't Christian leadership. I, I started to lead them in rebellion. The Beatles came and, in the 60s and I wanted to be like them. And so my dad was absolutely confused when I didn't want to cut my hair anymore. And I didn't cut my hair for three and a half years. I had ha hair down to like Todd White, you know what I mean? It was down to past, to my, past my shoulder, way past my shoulder. And um, I, I'm not sure, I may have been the first Korean hippie in North America, I'm not sure, but anyway. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I started to take drugs at a young age. By the time I was 15, no exaggeration, I did everything under the sun from pure heroin to cocaine, LSD, and I was absolutely out of control. By the time I was 17, I was a drug addict with $2,000 a month habit which is a lot of money back then. It is a lot today, but even back then. But by the grace of God, by I mean, God being rich in mercy, my parents prayed for me. They didn't know how to communicate with me because I quickly forgot the Korean language. And, you know, there was such a cultural gap and communication gap and generation gap back in those days. And, and, um, but how many know there's no gap with prayer? Yeah. Amen. And, and, you know, my grandmother, who just passed away a few years ago, by the way, died at the age of 101. And I have a theory, if you're in the glory, you're going to live long, amen, because there's no aging in heaven. I mean, Billy Graham is going to be 100 this November. He's still around, you know, it's just amazing. And so, uh, and, and so my grandmother was praying for me. And by the way, if your grandmother's praying for you, you don't have a chance. You will get saved. And so, you know... Uh, and by the way, I'm a grandparent now, and I pray. We have four grandchildren, beautiful. And uh, one of the things that my wife and I love to do, no matter where I'm in the world, we pray every day together. Thank God for FaceTime and Skyping. And uh, so we just prayed right before I came here. And uh, it's just been a, amazing to see all my kids, you know, by God's grace, come to know Jesus at a young age and walk with the Lord all the days of their lives. Two of them are pastors. And two of them were on our staff before they started to have children and decided to be stay-at-home moms with respectively two grandchildren each. And so, you know, it, it's, it's Acts 16, 31 says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you and your family will be saved. I, I'm prophesying to someone right now, you need to claim that verse for your family. Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus and you and your family will be saved. Because if God can save a drug addict like me, by the way, at a Deep Purple concert, that tells you my testimony. I, I walked out of a Deep Purple concert when they were playing Smoke on the Water. Now, some of you say, Deep Purple, who? You don't know who I'm talking about. I know this dates me, but for those who are of my generation, they were the number one rock band in 1973, and the number one song, Smoke on the Water. And that was so hard to get. We got the best seat of the Baltimore Civic Center, third row, right in the center of the stage. When God spoke to me during the intermission, if you want to follow me, you have to throw away your drugs, leave the concert, and follow me. And I did. And the moment I walked out of the Civic Center, I got instantly delivered from drug addiction, and I've been, I've been set free since. Never went back. Never. Not once. Not once backslid to... <laughs> You know, and I believe in all kinds of recovery programs, 12-step programs, but I like that one-step program. How about you? You know, boom, you know, you're delivered. And wow, it's been an incredible journey. Of course, the other areas of my life, God had to, and still is working and purifying. Uh, but it was just amazing to be set free and uh, to get my prayer language two weeks later. And I didn't even know anything about speaking in tongues. I didn't know what was going on. And, um, and to see wherever I went, people who were sick were getting healed. This is called the Jesus People Movement. I, I went to a party, a secular party, because uh, the food was free. How I many know when you're a college age, you know, you, you follow the free food? And so <laughs> I heard that there was someone's birthday party, and they were having this food catered. It was a multimillionaire in Potomac, Maryland. And I said, wow, I want to check this out. And um, I got invited through another friend. And we're not, uh, no exaggeration, one of the wealthiest in Washington, D.C., he had a horse ranch in Potomac, Maryland, one of the most exclusive parts of Washington, D.C. It's like the Beverly Hills of, of uh, D.C. area. Tennis court, swimming pool, horses, uh, thoroughbred that he was uh, uh, raising. And, uh, and so they had this party with around 40 college students from the University of Maryland, and I'm there. 
And, um, and, you know, the first two hours, I have to confess to you, I didn't open my mouth once. I didn't share with anyone that was a believer. I didn't know anyone there. I'm just eating, playing tennis because I like to play tennis. And while I was playing tennis, uh, the Lord convicted me. He said, you've been at this party for almost two hours and you haven't even opened your mouth once that you're a believer. And no one here is a believer. And so I stopped playing, walked to the middle of the tennis court, and I just walked up and called the guy over. He thought maybe, you know, I was tired or maybe injured, whatever. And I said, this may sound strange to you, but as I was playing, you see, I, a number of years ago, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. But I was uh, playing with you. The Lord told me to tell you how much he loves you. The Spirit of God fell upon him. And I asked him if he wanted to give his heart to Jesus Christ. He said, yes. So right there, we held hands across the tennis net, gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And I got so excited. I said, I know why I'm at this party. I said, I'm going to preach until I get kicked out. That was my commitment. I was just going to preach. I didn't care if I was obnoxious or whatever. So I started to share with people. And finally, the girl who was hosting the party said and cornered me and said, I hear you're preaching at my party. And so I'm thinking, okay, I'm getting the right foot of fellowship. She's going to kick me out. But here's what she said. You know, why don't I call everyone to the rec room and why don't you tell all of us the, the religious experience you had? I said, you're kidding me. And so she did, and she was a hostess with Moses. And so she invited everyone to the rec room, 40 kids all over the place. She introduces me like a speaker. So she said, I just met Che. I don't know anything about his background, but he's had some kind of religious experience, so I thought it would be good for him to share with all of us. And so I share my testimony, but part of my testimony is that when I got saved, I got healed of allergies. I had massive allergy problems, hay fever, food allergies, etc. And I got instantly healed. And so I shared that in my testimony. This guy sitting right there on the couch, he was a huge guy. He was a football player for Laura High School, now University of Maryland student. He was a fullback. And he looks at me and he interrupts me and says, can God heal me of my knee surgery? And I looked down, he was wearing shorts. And he said, I've had three... Uh, surgeries, and when I was a senior at Laura High School, uh, I got blindsided, and uh, this is before arthroscopic surgery, by the way, okay, so this is huge scars running down his knee, and I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm in constant pain, and uh, I'm in pain right now. If God could heal your allergies, can he heal me? I said, well, I'm not the healer, but let's pray, and, you know, I had a lot of mixed emotions, because I said, I didn't ask for this, Lord. I said, I'll <laughs> preach, but now we're turning into a healing service, you know, and, uh, and, and so I just got down on my knees, put my hand on his knee. I prayed some prayer. It wasn't the word prayer of faith. I didn't have much faith in that situation. I'm just really praying under my breath, oh, God, oh, God, get me out of this situation. <laughs> but here's what he said. He, he looks up at me, and he says, I'll never forget this. The expression on his face, his words, he said, it's gone. I said, what's gone? He said, the pain is gone. His best friend, who was sitting right behind him, said, I don't believe that. He turns to him and said, I'm telling you, man, it is gone. I was in excruciating pain. It just disappeared. And I said, well, do something you couldn't do before. And he said, I could definitely not do a knee bend. So I said, why don't you try? So he gets up and does a knee bend. And the Spirit of God falls. So I give an invitation. <laughs> Out of 40, no exaggeration, 40, around 30 of them, I said, if you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ, get down on your knees and pray this prayer with me. The secular party. They're on their knees and they give their hearts to Jesus Christ. Now, this is called the Jesus People Movement. This was our Bible study. Our Bible study went from a handful of young people to over 2,000 meetings every Tuesday night. And they were led by my spiritual mentor, who was two years older than me, and another guy that was a few years older than him. So, we're talking about a 19 year old and a 21 year old was leading this Bible study. Not ordained professional pastors. There were just two hippies that jumped in the river called the Jesus People Movement. And every week, between 150 and 200 people were getting saved. No exaggeration. And, um, and then we started a church and blew up to 3,000 people because, again, the harvest was coming in. Let me, let me share with you three characteristics of a historic revival. It's really important for us to understand what revival looks like, Okay. And, um, and by the way, you need to qualify it because there's no timetable. But these three things must take place in order for it to be a historic revival. First, number one, is the church is first revived. Revival begins with us. As First Peter 4, 7, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. As Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. 
Then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. So it begins with my people. It doesn't say the Republican Party. It doesn't say the Democratic Party. It says, if my people will humble themselves and pray, seek my face. You determine the destiny of this nation. As the church goes, so goes the nation. And if we're looking at secular humanism taking over, it's because the church has lost its flavor, its saltiness, its light, and we've become lukewarm. I mean, think about the church in Ephesus and Revelation 2. But when you read about Ephesus and how it started, it was started by the Apostle Paul, Acts 19. Revival broke out that God did extraordinary miracles for the Apostle Paul. That's the phrase in Acts 19, extraordinary miracles. Say extraordinary miracles. In other words, there were ordinary miracles and there were extraordinary miracles, okay? Extraordinary. That handkerchiefs and aprons from his body were taken to those who were demonized and they were being set free. They were being healed. And the whole, the Bible says all of Asia heard the gospel. We're talking about an apostolic center in Ephesus. Paul stays there for two years because the Spirit of God's moving. Like in Thessalonica, two weeks, but in Ephesus, two years. All of Asia heard the gospel. We're talking about Asia Minor today, which is Turkey, but, but nevertheless, it was just incredible. And so the center of gravity shifts from Antioch now to Ephesus. Eventually, we'll go to Rome. And just like, you know, every revival, there's a shift from Toronto to Bethel. I just gave you that. Azusa Street. I mean, it, it moves. And, and one of the things we have to do is recognize the day of visitation and be a God chaser. Because if you really want to catch the revival, think about it. If you lived in the United States in 1906, how many of you would have been in Azusa Street? I mean, if you heard about it, I would have been. I would have made a pil pilgrimage. And, and so, you know, and that's why I went to Toronto. That's why I went to Brownsville. That's why I went to Argentina in 91 when revival was breaking out there. That's why I'm in China right now. Because right now the harvest is coming in, 35,000 every day in China right now. It is the most amazing revival and harvest. And so, uh, and so the church gets revived. And so the church in Ephesus, even though they experience revival, within one generation, God has to write to them, I have this one thing against you. I know your hard works. You've tested false apostles, which implies there were true apostles as well. And he says, you've been patient, but the one thing I have against you is that you've lost your first love. That scares me, because if a church was birthed in revival through the Apostle Paul, and by the way, when Paul was beheaded by Nero, guess who took over that church? Timothy. So can you imagine your first two pastors, being Paul and Timothy, to lead your church? You're talking about a huge apostolic center. In fact, Mary, the mother of Jesus, moved from Jerusalem to Ephesus. She was buried in Ephesus because she was attracted to the revival that was breaking out there. It's amazing history of Ephesus. But the point I want to make is that if that could happen to a New Testament church that had the Apostle Paul as their senior pastor losing their first love, then we're kidding ourselves that we can't lose our first love 2,000 years later. See, my goal was never to start, we're talking about, I never started to uh, plan to start an apostolic network. You know, I, I'm a chancellor of a seminary. I never asked for the seminary. It's just something that happened as we were in the river. But I tell you the thing that I've been passionate about. My passion is to maintain the same love, if not greater love, for Jesus as I did when I first got saved. Yeah. And that's why, that's why I'm in the river, because you can't do it in your own strength. It is Zechariah 4, 6. It's not by might. It's not by power. That is your power. But by my spirit, says the Lord, is Zechariah 4, 6. And that's why, that's why Moses was saying, unless your presence goes with us, we can go no further. He knew that the presence of God was everything. When you have the presence, you have everything. We say in HIM, the presence of God is not just the icing on the cake. It's not like if we have a good meeting, oh, the presence of God showed up, you know, it's the icing on the cake. No, we say it is the cake. It is what we're after. We're after the presence. And that was our DNA from day one, okay? Because one, once again, we made a covenant to jump in the river. And the presence of God, I tell you, wherever the presence goes, the blessing of God follows. The presence of God, it's amazing. It's a key to revival and reformation of society. It's the key to your blessing, and, and there's no way that you could be transformed. We're being changed from glory to glory, right? Second Corinthians three eighteen, into his image. 
but it's from glory to glory. It's from doxa to doxa. We need his manifest presence to be changed. Let me give you an example. You know, I was just thinking about this because, uh, you know, I'm in Seattle. And, um, and Wendell Smith and City Church here uh, is very, very dear to us because uh, Wendell and I knew each other when we were both working with young people in the 70s. And so when he planted the uh, uh, City Church here um, in, in Seattle, um, you know, he asked me to come. And this is back in the 90s, so he asked us to come and bring the Toronto blessing because he wanted that. He was hungry for that. So, so we went there and, um, and hosted some meetings. And he had a church around 700 at that time. And, of course, it's blown up. But it was powerful. And I'll never forget when one year we came, I think it was in 95, I brought my wife, Sue. And so Wendell said, Wendell and Jenny said, uh, our son, Judah, is a backslidden teenager. He's around 17, 18 years old. And uh, could you just pray for him? And we said, of course, you know. So Sue takes the initiative and just talks with Judah just a little bit. This is after the meeting on the side. She lays hands on him, and the power of God hits him, and he's on the ground for almost two hours. When he gets up from the ground, he is totally transformed, baptized in the Holy Spirit on fire for Jesus Christ. One touch from the Master. One touch. And he shared that testimony at major conferences like Hillsong, Australia, that Pastor Sue prayed for me. And I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he got activated back into ministry. That's why the presence of God is everything. I could tell you the story about two things coming to mind. One is on our staff member. She was not on our staff when she first came to Mata Auditorium. And, um, and I remember uh, seeing her on the floor just weeping and laughing, weeping and laughing for like two hours. I didn't know who she was. But obviously the Holy Spirit was doing a deep work. And so we just said, just bless the ministry. Just bless what the Holy Spirit is doing. Just stay by her. Well, we didn't know that she had been sexually molested all her life. And when she had gotten married... She could not physically love her husband. And they were struggling in their marriage, trying to make it work for eight years. And because they were Christians, you know, I mean, some guys would have said, I'm calling for annulment because, you know, we can't even consummate this relationship. But they would spend thousands of dollars on psychotherapy, Christian counselor, marriage counselor. Nothing worked. She gets up, and we don't know anything about her back when we found this out afterwards. She goes home. To her, her husband was not at the meeting. She goes home, and uh, if I could just be real, can I be real here? Yeah. She initiates to make love to her husband that night. He jumps out of bed because he thinks that a wrong woman came into the house, <laughs> and you know, some woman that you know, he thought was a stranger that got in bed with him. <clears throat> How many know that's good fruit? Come on. God healed their marriage, and both of them. Uh, were on our staff until just recently uh, when uh, they, they moved on. But they were on our staff for over a dozen years. It, it's, just, it's amazing. You can't buy that. Thousands of dollars worth of counseling and yet one touch of the Holy Spirit can transform your life. That's revival. And God will do that. God will do that to help you to return to your first love so you get on fire for the Lord. And He wants to touch you tonight. Some of you need a major encounter with the Holy Spirit. But let me, let me qualify by saying this. Don't compare your experience with anyone else. You've got to receive it by faith. Because the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples with a mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire. The whole place shook. A lot of manifestation, right? With Jesus, it was a dove. Gently on him. Same power, but different manifestation. Same Holy Spirit, but different manifestation. And I have seen, like my daughter Grace, you know, was at your meeting, you know. She wasn't like the rest of the kids who were just all, we call them live wires, you know, Mary and, you know, they prophesy like Stacy Campbell and they shake all over the place and, and my son is the same way, but uh, Grace never manifested. But she was so powerful and, uh, in her ministry. And, and, and so we begin to realize, you know, the Holy Spirit is doing something unique with each person wherever you're at, but you just got to receive it by faith. So the first characteristic is that the church is revived. Number two, Unbelievers are awakened and the harvest comes in. In a historic revival, the church gets blessed and revived. It's to bring back to life, right? And the church can be dead, right? And so you bring back to life. But the harvest comes in every time a historic revival. 
Now, it may not happen right there and then, but the harvest comes in. Like the Jesus People Movement, Time Magazine did an issue in 1971 called the Jesus Revolution with a picture of Jesus on the front cover. And they reported, and they were talking about Lonnie Frisbee and Chuck Smith and what was breaking out in Southern California, but they estimated 2 million teenagers had gone saved by 71. Amen. By the way, I got saved in 73, and so a lot more people got saved. And so if we're talking about 2 million by 71, we're talking about incredible harvest. And by the way, I've not seen a harvest like that since the Jesus People days. Even the Welsh Revival in 1904, according to historians, 100,000 got saved the first six months of that Welsh revival, which is a huge amount back in, in Wales and the population of, the, of that nation, 100,000. I mean, I was thinking about uh, the revival in Argentina. We went to Hector Jimenez's church, and a church that just blew up to 150,000 overnight. And they had services, get this, 23 hours a day, seven days a week. And you could only go to one service a week. And uh, people were lined up. The building only held, uh, held around 2,500. And so there were people lined up every two hours for a service. And, uh, I, I, you know, I said, this is what revival looks like. I mean, when we talk about 3 million getting saved in San Diego, that's revival. The Hebrides Revival in 1948, which is a set of islands off of Scotland, the glory came. It's such power that, according to Duncan Campbell, who was a Scottish evangelist, he said in one particular island, the Lewis Island, everyone on the island got saved. He said there was not one unbeliever on the island. To accommodate the crowds, and by the way, they didn't get saved in services. They got saved in, bu in, in pubs, bars. Uh, they, they got saved at work. They got saved uh, at home. The conviction of God would come upon them as they're just walking through their village. Then they went to service. And by the way, when they got to the service, every church building had to have four services a day, seven days a week. People worked during the daytime, so they had services at 7.30, 9.30, 11.30, 30, and 1.30 in the morning. Every single church building. Just imagine if everyone in Seattle got saved. Where would you put them? That's why Lou Engel is saying Stadium Christianity. That God wants to move because the Bible says the harvest is at the end of the age. What a, does a billion soul harvest that Bob Jones prophesied in 83 look like? And by the way, he said that was just the first wave. He said they would be the disciples, the leadership for the next wave of a billion souls. Look, there's 7 billion plus people on the planet Earth. And when we talk about the harvest, there's a great harvest taking place, which is amazing. 200,000 are getting saved every day. But you still have 1.7 billion Muslims that have never heard the gospel. How many know God loves the world? Amen? By the way, only 1% of the U.S. mission dollars goes to reach Muslim. 1% of all the money that we collect in missions, 1% for 1.7 billion. And that's why in HIM we're shifting that and we're saying at least a tithe of everything that comes in is going to go to reach the Muslim people because God loves the nations. And he wants us to look. In China, even though it's mass harvest, you're talking about 1.5 to 1.6 billion people there. We're talking about a billion and a half that have never heard the gospel yet. So we have our work cut out. So the harvest is at the end of the age, and so the harvest has to come in. And that's why, you know, now some people have said, well, we didn't see much harvest with Toronto. And that's true. But just like we didn't see a lot of harvest in Azusa Street. You have to understand, Azusa Street wasn't that large. It was around 300 people that met. But the harvest that hit the world globally, people who left Azusa Street, John G. Lake went to South Africa, and revival broke out and the harvest came in mass. So you have to quantify it from more of a, a macro perspective and long-term perspective, not say, well, you know, only so many people got saved in Los Angeles during the 1906 Azusa Street. If you quantify it that way, you're going to say it's not a real revival. So I feel in the same way, even the Toronto Toronto impacted people like me, for example. And I was just talking to one of our apostles in India. Her name is Liana Cinquanta. And uh, she was at our international apostolic team meeting. Uh, we had right before the conference that Darren was talking about. Two years ago, she comes to me and says, she calls me Papa Che. She said, Papa Che, I have a problem. I said, what's the problem? She said, 
And by the way, she was a member of our church. She was going to Fuller Seminary. And um, she got her master's in cross-cultural ministry. And she came up to me and said, I bought a one-way ticket to Varanasi, India, which is northern part, the Uttar Pradesh, one of the most unreached part of India. And she says, it's a prophetic gesture saying, I'm going there and I'm going to die there. Can I be sent out by HIM? I didn't know her. I said, of course, we'll send you out. And we've been supporting her. But two years ago, she came to me and said, I have a problem. I said, what's your problem? She said, I can't break through the 100,000 barrier. I said, I beg your pardon. She, she said, this year and last year, we led 100,000 to Jesus Christ, but we can't go beyond that. So it's not 105, it's not 110,000, 100,000. I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> How many know that's a good problem? You know, here in America, we're trying to break the 100 barrier, 200 barrier. For membership, not souls. And she is having a problem leading 100,000, but no more. You know, it's like she hit this barrier. And so that would not have happened if it wasn't for Toronto. So you can't really just quantify how many people came forward at a Toronto meeting, you know, because the ripple effect of revival. And so you can't measure, and I'm going to say this to encourage you, Jeremy, and, because I know people are getting saved. These are 12 people. Who, you can't. One person could be the next Billy Graham. Really. And so you, you can't quantify it right there. You have to look at it. So this leads to the third point. First, the church is revived. Second, the harvest comes in, right? And don't judge when the harvest, but the harvest comes in and historic revival. Third is that there's reformation of society. Again, you know, we want to see reformation immediately. We want to see transformation of a city. And so people criticize us at Brownsville. Well, it didn't seem like there was a lot of change, and there were still drug addicts there and prostitutes. And, you know, and I understand that the crime rate didn't change after the revival, and we didn't see that in Toronto. But again, I think we're putting God in a box. You have to take a step back and say, what is the overflow of the revival on a macro perspective? You have to understand, we were talking about this over dinner. The Great Awakening with John Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards here in America began in 1738. And one of the major issues that they were focusing on and preaching was the abolition, abolition of slavery and slave trade in Great Britain. You have to understand, Great Britain had the monopoly on slave trade. They had bought out the Spaniards, they had bought out the French, and it was the number one source of income for that nation at that time. It would be like what petroleum is for Russia or Saudi Arabia today. It was the single most dominant economic source. Towns were born out of the slave trade. And so for them to give that up, it would take an awakening. And that's what happened. An awakening took place. People, unbelievers, began to see that this was... Uh, heinous crime because we're talking about people made in the image of God that we're actually making a profit by selling them to the United States and, uh, and uh, in fact uh, uh, Wilberforce, William Wilberforce who was a champion and he wasn't the only one, I mean you know you read John Wesley's letters, he spoke out against slavery before Wilberforce was even born but if you're a Christian you're going to, again revival is heaven invading earth, there's no slavery and racism in heaven right? There's no injustice. And I'm not just talking about social injustice. I'm talking about biblical justice coming to earth as it is in heaven. Can I hear an amen? amen. And so, so anyway, uh, and so uh, Wilberforce gets saved under Whitfield's preaching. He has this encounter with the Holy Spirit where he knows his divine assignment. Everyone has a divine assignment. is to work for the rest of his life to end slave trade as a member of parliament, because he was already a member of parliament when he got saved. He was a Cambridge graduate, member of parliament, and he was going to spend the rest of his life to end slave trade. But here's the point. Slavery did not end until 1833 in Great Britain, a hundred years after the Reformation or the Great Awakening began. Great Awakening, 1838, I mean 1738, and slavery ended in 1833. So we're talking about almost a hundred years later. See, I've been saying that I, we're going to see the overturn of Roe v. Wade. I've been prophesying that since I got saved in 73. It was when Roe v. Wade became legal. I, I believe that is the issue of injustice today. You're talking about lives, innocent babies. You know, I've had four grandchildren, and today we have a 3D sonogram. It's amazing, the, the sophistication. And by the way, there's a shift in our nation because when we started the call in the year 2000, only 38% of Americans were pro-life. Today, 
are pro-life. And by the way, the millennium, millennial generation is leading the way. They're more pro-life than boomers are of our generation. So your generation has a sense of uh, justice in their DNA. They just know it's wrong. And, uh, but uh, the shift to 52% are now pro-life. It's amazing. That's what it's going to take, a, a mental revolution, and then the laws can be passed, okay? Because then people are behind it. You can't just try to make it happen in your own strength. There has to be revival. There has to be awakening. Unbelievers have to be awakened, and they have to get saved, and their minds get transformed, and all of a sudden they begin to align with biblical worldview instead of humanistic worldview, and the reformation takes place in society. Now, we saw things happen in our city when the revival broke out. Pasadena was the murder capital of Los Angeles. People don't realize that because they think of South Central, they think of Watts, but because of the gang wars between the Bloods and the Crips, we were averaging a homicide a day in the northwest section of Pasadena. And uh, today, all the gangs have been moved out, and it's amazing. There hasn't been a homicide in years. So you could say, well, that's anecdotal, you know. Maybe it's a coincidence. You've got a new chief of police. And I said, let me, let me tell you some other things. When I moved to Pasadena, old Pasadena was a red light district. It was dilapidated, adult bookstores, prostitutes hanging around the street. You go to old Pasadena now, you can't find one adult bookstore, not one prostitute. I'm not saying they're not there, but you can't find them. They're not out there in your face. Now it's high-end restaurants and stores. It's just a major tourist attraction. The final thing I want to share is that we had a major cult headquarters in Pasadena called the Worldwide Church of God with Herbert Armstrong in Plain Truth magazine. And it really began with them because we're saying, what's wrong with our city? Why are we not seeing transformation? We've seen revival of the nightly meetings and church getting blessed and revived. But what about the transformation aspect? And God spoke to Lou Engel is that we need to bind the strong man behind the Worldwide Church of God. It came by revelation. We were having early morning prayer meetings. We still do. After all these years, we still have six days a week at six o'clock in the morning and our church had become to Pasadena and was at one of those prayer meetings that Louis said uh, we need to bind the strong man behind the worldwide church of God so we were doing that in the morning but we felt we need to do something more so we called for a solemn assembly we call, called other churches together I'll never forget like on a Tuesday night 600 people showed up and our church at that time was maybe around 300 and, uh, and so people from other churches came and we bound the strong man because how many know we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in the heaven places, against the world forces of this present darkness in, in Ephesians 6, uh, verse 12. And, uh, and so two weeks later, after that solemn assembly, Lou comes running into the prayer room, holding the front page of the Los Angeles Times. He said, Jay, Armstrong died last night, died. It says, Armstrong dead, age 91. And I said to him, Lou, I don't think our prayers killed him. He died of old age, okay? He was 91 years old. <laughs> but you know what Daniel says? That God raises up kings and puts down kings. And something was going on because the successor comes in and he dies after six months. So Armstrong's successor dies right afterwards as well. The third successor, he gets saved. And he begins to repent on behalf of the worldwide of all the false doctrine. And revival breaks out in the Worldwide Church of God. Now they're part of the National Association of Evangelical Churches and the Evangelical Movement. In my opinion, it was probably the greatest fruit of revival in 44 years of walking. All the healings, raising the dead, all the people I've seen healed. That was the greatest miracle to see a whole movement. It's like seeing Jehovah's Witness getting saved. Come, come on. Or the Mormons. Come on. Let's believe God for that. I mean, you know, we have a tipping point with the Worldwide Church. Why can't we believe God for that? So what does revival look like? This is why we have to contend, and we're not there. But we go from glory to glory. So there's church getting revived, so you need to receive first. Because you're the carrier of glory. It's Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are all called to be revivalists and reformers. You know, we all say we're kings and priests, and that's true. But the fact is, you're carriers of God's glory. He never intended for just the 12 to do it. He says, you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my lay down lovers, beginning in your Jerusalem, your Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, but begins with you. And so what I want to do is I want to pray for an impartation that whatever the Lord has done in Pasadena with the nightly meetings and what we've seen glo globally, really, 
I want to pray that God would make a deposit here tonight. And uh, tomorrow it will be a different kind of impartation because I want to talk about apostles and how God's restoring apostles and how they're the key to reformation of society tomorrow. And I'm going to uh, pray uh, for those who are called to be apostolic or apostles uh, tomorrow. But let's all stand up right now. Here's, here's what I want to do. I want to give an invitation to return to your first love. You know, we're on different place of the spectrum of, of what that means and what that looks like. But it's interesting that every time the Holy Spirit is promised, it says first repent. You know, Acts 3.19, repent. At times a refreshing may come from the Lord. Or how about Joel 2.28? And afterwards, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh, right? But after what? Well, the verse 12, Joel 2, verse 12 says, Repent, he will worship. Repent with all your heart, with weeping, fasting, mourning. And then he says, and afterwards, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I love Acts 5.32, where the Bible says, The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. How many of you want the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Well, it's just obedience. It's a fresh consecration. You know, Second Chronicles 16.9 says, The eyes of the Lord look throughout the whole earth, that he may show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are completely his. And you know, I pray this prayer every day. I pray what I call the disciples' prayer. It's not the Lord's prayer in Matthew 6, because in the prayer it says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And Jesus never sinned was for us to pray that. It's a disciple's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in my heart, in my life. I'm asking for the rule and reign to come in my heart and life, and his kingdom comes in power. So that includes being filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you following me? So I want you to make a fresh consecration to the Lord right now. And I want you to pray that prayer with me. Just say, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In my heart. In my life. Go ahead. Just offer yourself as a living and holy sacrifice to the Lord. Just you do some talking with God and just say, God, I want to repent. I want to just renounce any compromise with pornography, with alcoholism, with drugs, sleeping around, whatever the issue may be, because... The Holy Spirit's given to those who obey Him. There's no condemnation, but there is conviction. And God's saying tonight, let's not play church. Let's not talk about revival. Let's say, I want to revive the beginning of my heart for real. I want the Holy Spirit to rule and reign in my life. Come, Holy Spirit. We love you so much. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh. Now, I know we're all praying that prayer, and those who are watching online, by the way, I know that you're praying that prayer as well. When we talk about the kingdom of God, Jesus said, if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, know that the kingdom of God's in your midst. So the kingdom, the Bible says, comes in power. So when you're asking for his kingdom to come, you're asking for his power to come. You can't change apart from the grace of God. Again, in Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, not by power, your power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's why Zechariah goes on to say, who's going to move that mountain before me? Well, as soon as you say grace, grace to it, it's by grace it's going to be removed. And that mountain will be leveled into a plain. And I think that's a lot of metaphors concerning the seven mountains and all that. And I really believe it's going to be by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can see the seven mountains taken. But whatever the mountain is in your life, I speak grace, grace to you right now. In Yeshua HaMashiach's name. In Jesus' name, in his mighty name. Now, I see the Spirit of God falling on a number of you. One of the things I've learned 
is when the Spirit of God's touching you, don't resist it. Whatever He's doing, just yield yourself to it. Because I've learned the more I yield, the more He comes upon me. So if I, for example, you know, feel like tears are coming out, I don't try to say, I need to man up and not cry at church. No, no, I just go ahead and weep. Tears are a manifestation. If you're shaking, you say, well, you know, no, just go ahead. Say more, Lord. I just yield myself to you. I'm just seeing just the presence of God touching people's head all the way down. It's just, just like this tingling sensation is coming. And some of you are starting to manifest. Now, what I want to do is I, I want to just bless what the Father's doing. If the Lord is touching you, you're manifesting in some way. Would you just come out of your seat and just come up here and line up up front here? You know who you are. You're just saying that, yeah, it's, you know, just the waves of His glory is touching me. And, and um, you just want to just bless what the Father's doing. And I want to bless what the Father's doing, yeah. And I don't know how you do it in your house, but I assume you guys have ushers and catchers as well. Just so it'll be a safe place here. But what I want to do is just uh, just go from one side to the other. Just, just bless what the Father's doing. Just lay my hands on you. And again, it's just to John 5, 19, do what I see the Father do. We want to love on you. But I want you to, by faith, receive one touch of the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget when I was at Arlen Askew's church in Portland, Oregon. And he was meeting at a theater, a movie theater. And in the first service, I prayed for this uh, young lady in her 20s. And she was laughing throughout the rest of the evening. But the second service started, and, and she was in the first service, and she was still laughing through the second service. I said, this is unusual, because, you know, we're talking about, like, over two hours of laughing. So I went to her, and I said, what's the Lord doing? I just want to bless what God's doing. She said, I've been on Prozac since I was five years old. I'm on the largest dosage of antidepressant drugs legally allowed for, for my age. And I have not laughed in those years of depression. One touch of the Holy Spirit, she got delivered from that spirit. It was really a demon, a spirit of depression. So I want to lay hands on you. Whatever where the, whatever the Holy Spirit's doing, I just want to bless. Healing you needed, just be healed. Deliverance, be delivered. Be filled and just encounter the Holy Spirit, whatever he wants to do. So Steve, thank you for just having some worship as we... If I could have some mushrooms, just come follow me wherever I go.
my heart, you're my first let me uh, have the interns and ministry team just help me. Let's just begin to flow and pray for people. Bless them and just do what you see the Father do, okay? So let's just continue to pray for one another. bunch of guys to help catch right over here Tom put your hand up if we get a bunch of strong able bodies we'll make sure that you get prayed for you get special you'll get special treatment if you catch to be 
everybody. We're going to go off the air for the night. Have yourself a great night. And we'll see you tomorrow morning, 10 a.m.